Hey, everybody. This is Heather Vickery. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Brave Files podcast. Hey, how y'all doing out there? This is week three for us here in Chicago to be quarantined and sheltered in place. And I know that most of the world is experiencing this very same thing. Um, you guys doing okay? I would love to know how are you staying stable and sane and brave throughout all of this? Are you finding creativity? Are you just getting by? I know for me personally, it kind of goes day by day. Uh, I'll have a couple of really good days and then a really challenging day. And I'm just trying to be patient with myself and give myself grace and listen to my body's needs and support my family. So connect with me. Give me a call at 312-646-0205 and let me know how you are coping and how I can support you. One thing that I am doing through Facebook is having a weekly virtual gratitude circle. If you are interested in learning more about that, join my private Facebook group, Brave on Purpose, and we are sharing links. It's happening at 12 noon central every Monday. We would love to have you come and join us and tell us what you're grateful for. It's really important to continue to find the gratitude, especially in times of distress. Um, this global pandemic is not a joke, y'all. So I I hope that you are taking good care of yourself. And on that note, this episode is really perfect for this time. I can't think of anything more perfect. I chatted with Alexia Vernon, who has created a soul-stirring call to action for women. Alexia empowers women to speak up for themselves and for the ideas and issues that matter most to them. She starts daring conversations, and that is definitely something here at The Brave Files that we can get behind. I hope you will tune in as we talk about prosperity and what that actually means. Hint, it's not just money. We talk about how bravery is not the absence of fear. Now, y'all have heard that before on this show, but it's a great way to hear it again and be reminded. We want you to feel the fear, but not be paralyzed. We want you to take action even when it's scary. And we talk about how we can help women come home to their own voices unapologetically and powerfully. This is a great conversation. I'm so glad you're going to be here to join in with us. Take good care and be in touch. Moxie, surrender, trust. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Brave Files. This is Heather Vickery, and I am so glad you decided to join us today. Today, we're joined by Alexia Vernon, and this lady has created a soul-stirring call to action for women to speak up for themselves and the ideas and issues that matter most to them. She's all about daring conversations, and I'm super excited to have one with her right now. Alexia, welcome to The Brave Files. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this. We've played a cat and mouse game to get um, <laughs> this interview together. So I hope you are comfy and cozy and have a warm cup of something ready to go for this, um, this chat we're about to have. Alexia, can you tell us just a little bit about who you are? What's your background? And, and we'll figure out how that led you into creating soul stirring connection for women to step up into who they're meant to be, which is awesome. Who am I? It's a question I ask a lot <laughs> these days, <laughs> particularly on a morning where am I the vomit cleaner upper as my daughter has the stomach flu, oh, am no. I the CEO of a business that now employs my husband, am I a human who is looking for deep connection with her clients? I kid somewhat, but uh, yes. <laughs> you are, yes, all of those things. <laughs> I'm all of those things. Uh, sometimes there's competing interests, but at the core, I am somebody who has had 
a difficult, very nonlinear journey to finding and consistently using her voice in the world to speak up for the ideas and issues that matter most to her. So I am a proud introvert. I, <laughs> I don't I think I would that. guess that. Yeah. <laughs> I say that because a lot of people are surprised. They think you have spent the majority of your professional life showing women how to speak with Moxie, whether that's in presentations to grow their business, in keynotes, in negotiation, or in daring conversations in the workplace. And the reason I'm so passionate about that work is because it took me a really long time to get there. And yeah. once I cultivated the mindset and developed the behaviors and ultimately the habits to be able to do that work for myself, I became super passionate about showing other women, particularly those who may not feel like assertiveness is in their DNA, how to be able to 100% be themselves and yet be unapologetic about using their voices. Yeah, I love that. I just had a conversation with a client uh, last week, we were at a, a group function. It was a corporate client and she was very chatty in a great way. It was a, we were talking about a five-year strategic plan for one of their employee network groups. And she was just very vocal. And after the conversation was over, somebody came up, one of the partners came up and said, wow, you had a lot to say today. And her immediate reaction was, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And I was like, what did you just say? What did you just say? Like, okay, hold on. We're going to go have a cocktail. She needs to walk away now. And I was like, I never, ever want to hear that from you again, ever. So many of us have internalized the message, or in some cases, we've been outright told yes. that we're too much. And as a result, we ping pong between those feelings of I'm too much, and yet I'm also not enough. And we absolutely positively need to give ourselves permission to a hold space for the fact we may feel that way, but to recognize that that's a story and that that's not the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get here? What, what were you like as a child? What did you anticipate doing with your life? My husband and I were having this conversation the other night, not that we've been together 17 years, so he knows a lot, but we, in the context of talking about our daughter and how multi-passionate she was, I was that kid who loved to succeed, but loved to do it in ways where the visibility was on my achievement rather than on me, meaning- Oh, Yeah. I would enter talent competitions, whether it was dance or theater, because there was safety behind a character or behind choreography. I would go to things like space camp because I was incredibly talented and worked hard at science, where my acumen was the thing that I was, I was noted for. The very first time I gave a presentation, I talk about this a lot in my speeches and in my book, it went horribly awry. I was in third or fourth grade, and when I got in front of my classmates, my voice began to quaver. I got the shakes. I started to cry. And from that point on, for a lot of years, I went into the story whenever I felt eyes on me that when I speak, I'm going to diminish myself. Although mm -hmm. you have to figure, I probably said that in the child version of that. Right. <laughs> sure. And so I would always cling to notes like a baby koala clings to its mother or to a tree <laughs> and never wanted to feel like I was in a teenage or even, I mean, this continued into my twenties and one of those gotcha moments where I just wasn't prepared and I didn't have everything perfectly sculpted. And so somewhat ironically, I wound up on the speaking circuit at 19. I had entered the Miss Junior America competition and I won and that was a really interesting period because on one hand, some outside force had determined that I was a role model and could motivate young people. But on the inside, I felt like when I succeeded, and obviously I had succeeded the night of that pageant, I was performing the best version of who I wanted to be rather than surrendering and kind of melting into who I authentically am. Yeah. And from there, I wound up, I went to college and majored in women's studies. I went to grad school and did a program that fused women's studies and theater and leadership development and wound up 
doing training in the nonprofit and educational mm. development sector. And <laughs> so I was many really, of us have been in that space. <laughs> I was really, really good in small groups. Like I got to that place where when I was facilitating and sharing space with people, it felt like I could rely on my questions and on mirroring back what I was hearing. Like I had coach pretty much tattooed across my heart before I knew that there was even this profession called coaching. But I started to get asked to give more and more presentations. And it wasn't until I left the company that I was working for, hung out my shingle, and was probably two or three years into my business, that I had a moment where I was asked to be the closing keynote speaker at a prestigious Mm -hmm. social enterprise conference. That's awesome. And I got to the event early before I had to speak so that I could watch what was going on. And I got there in time for the participants pitch fest. And there were probably 120 somethings. And I mean, I was like 28 or 29 at the time. So I wasn't all that much older than the audience. And each of them had a couple of minutes to present their big idea for how they wanted to harness entrepreneurial solutions to solve a big social, economic, or environmental problem. And the pitches were really good across the board. They were bold and well-researched and full of heart. And the finalists were voted on by the other people in attendance. The the population was probably 50% female, 50% male, average age maybe like 22, 23, just out of college. And I share those details with you because they're relevant since when the finalists' names were announced, I was Mm -hmm. stunned given the makeup of the room that every single finalist was a young man. Oh. Not one woman's voice was picked. Wow. And it was one of those moments where I felt sucker punched, but also probably more curious than I'd ever been. And so I asked questions during the break of whoever would speak to me and on Twitter, because that was when everyone used to tweet to each other at conferences. And (laughs) I love that. What just happened? Where are the voices of the young women? And what was so interesting was that the men and the women actually had the exact same answer. They said they voted on who was the best pitcher. And when I asked them to unpick that a little bit, they said, well, you know, who took up space and projected Mm. confidence, all the, the stereotypes we would associate with a more masculine model of delivery. But yet when I asked, who were the speakers that you felt most connected to, whose ideas you wanted to champion. Both actually named a lot of the women Mm -hmm. with a caveat. They said, well, they told great stories. I trusted them. They were vulnerable. But in a lot of cases, they admit they still had more to learn before they felt like they could accept funding. And obviously, that's not someone who should win a pitch fest. Uh, That's the whole point. (laughs) Well, it was was one of those (laughs) eureka moments for me in two ways. Number one, I realized, oh, this is actually a mirror for everything that's been going on for me since I made the decision to want to be a speaker. Mm -hmm. I keep flip-flopping between who I think I'm supposed to be, this extrovert who fist pumps and uh, has all the answers and is perfectly sculpted. And that's not me. Who I am is a little scrappy. <laughs> sometimes my voice still quavers. I had tongue <laughs> thrust as a kid, and sometimes my consonants sound slurred. I love to tell stories. I love to be funny, but I I want to be me. And so, and I and I want to show other people how to be able to do that yeah. if I could figure this out for myself. And it was also the first time I went on stage. I completely dropped the whole script, spoke from my heart. Yes. Actually, me. Yeah real eye contact with the audience, ask questions, wasn't afraid to piss a few people off. And, you know, nothing is like, I don't believe rainbows and cupcakes after one of those aha moments. But that (laughs) was when I did start to speak in a completely different way. My business had been all over the freaking place in the career leadership development, multiple generations in the workplace sector. And I really honed in on high stakes communication and presentation skills. I do a lot with women. I I work in organizations with women and men, but like that was a big turning point for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That I, I love anytime I can hear somebody's sort of eureka moment where they go, wait a minute, hold up. There's a space here that I can fill. And you learn so much about yourself when you do that. So what shifted from that moment with how you proceeded with your business. Like Mm -hmm. what did you change once that happened? So 
as backstory because context matters deeply because I think we go through something and then because of the way our life looks at that moment, it may not mean something and the exact same thing could happen at a different time and we have a dramatic different aha. So at at that particular moment, I had felt like I was at the pinnacle of success and then everything started to crumble around me. And what I mean by that is I was maybe two or three years into my coaching business at that point and I just landed a six-figure corporate speaking and training contract. And I was at the top of, of my game, I thought. And yet I kept feeling like I was circling around the perimeter of my purpose in terms of the work that I really wanted to do, the deeper, more holistic work. And I kept telling myself, well, once I mm. am able to save <laughs> X amount of dollars yeah. or my list is this size, then I can do what I really want to do. And so Within weeks of that whole situation happening, the government that had been funding this project within healthcare pulled the funding. So this was right around the time of the recession. And suddenly I was left with very little revenue secured. My husband and I had just bought our first home. He was laid up, which is like in some ways worse than being laid off because you're basically yeah. you're not let go. So you can't collect unemployment, but you're not needed for the foreseeable future. And it was definitely an O-S-H-I-T moment of like, what are we going to do here? And so I recognize if I have to grow my business fast and this other thing that I've been doing because it felt like, well, revenue stable isn't stable, then let me give myself permission to build the business I want to build. And so everything I built from that day forward, like I don't think I actually went after another kind of gig, like the kinds that I've been doing, which felt like they were incredibly left brained and just telling people what to do. And at first, because I needed revenue, I created this little package (laughs) of, I think it was like, you know, a thousand dollars for six weeks for an individual to create their signature talk. And from there started running group programs first live Las Vegas, Nevada is my home. And so I did these six week programs that culminated with the women doing a performance. Then a year ish later, I wound up getting pregnant. And by that point, I'd really done a pretty good job of pivoting most of my business to keynotes and to working in organizations, doing the deeper speaker work. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, I'm sure we'll get into this life changed dramatically in terms of how I wanted to be present, suddenly traveling all the time at that stage with my daughter when the newborn wasn't sexy, particularly when my husband was traveling six days a week absolutely um, for his own work. And so that's when I started to bring more things online and then start to ask a new set of questions like, okay, we figured out revenue once, but how do we change the revenue balance so I can do a lot more remotely than what I have been? Yeah. I What I love about that is for everyone who's listening, you get to rewrite it as your life changes and alters to be the way you want it to be. So what feels most important at one moment can and does shift as as your life experiences change. And you don't have to give up your business because you're going to be a parent. I mean, unless you want to, you're entitled to, uh, <laughs> but you can, you can just change it. You can grow it in different ways. I, I think that's a, a lovely gift to share with everybody. You mentioned that you uh, had your husband retire and join your company. I love that so much because it flips gender norms on its head uh, in a really big way. And I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, what was what was it like deciding you wanted to do that and and encouraging him to do that? And do you ever fight uh, gender norms with those with that new role? Oh, these are such good questions that I love to answer because I find a lot of my clients are fascinated about this as well because they experience both of us together in different ways. So I don't honestly think that I would have ever thought that was a possibility, even though the business started to generate more revenue than my husband was making in his job. But just the idea that the business always felt like this little baby that was full of surprises (laughs) and volatility and could make beautiful things happen, but we never wanted to rely on it. It was always icing. And my husband's was the relatively stable piece. But I wound up in a mastermind program with Natalie Lussier, who some of your listeners may know. She's the founder. She used to do a lot more um, coaching, but now she's the founder and CEO of a company called Access Ally that does tech software. 
And the year that I was in her program, her husband wound up coming into the business full time. And so I got to watch that transition close up and it planted the seed. Like, I don't remember being in that program saying, I must do this as well, but it was really lovely to go to retreats and see how they were navigating that. The difference was they were building a software company and her husband had a background in that. And so it felt like, well... He's literally bringing his same skill set to the business. So this is a no brainer for the two of them. For me, my husband was a what, well, is still at his core, a wildlife biologist. He's worked for an environmental consulting company. Prior to that, he worked in the nonprofit sector doing environmental justice organizing in the South Bronx, like not necessarily the most complimentary skill set for somebody who's running a women's empowerment business. But when my daughter was gosh, in reverse, it's always complicated to figure out the time. But well, I I could say that from the time she was probably six months old until we ultimately made the decision at three, he would go through these cycles. I mean, it could be four to five months at a time where he would be traveling five to six days a week away from home. And I was pretty fragile as a new mom. I mean, I think all new moms are fragile, but I'd had postpartum depression and I honestly wasn't sure if I was going to be able to raise my daughter without my mom being by my side every day, not because I didn't attach, I attached totally, but I was so terrified of myself, not of consciously doing anything to my daughter, but I suddenly felt like I could drop her at any moment or I couldn't get the car seat, like (laughs) all that stuff that is really like classic postpartum, all those horrendous panic attacks. Like if I have a panic attack and she's on a changing table and I'm not okay. And so while I did a lot of work to be able to get through that, um, the idea of even having a really great nanny in the home with me while I was working, like I just felt like I was a single parent a lot. Yeah. It's a horrible thing to say because my my spouse is the most extraordinary parent and partner, but he just physically wasn't there. Right. And when we started to ask all the questions of, well, what are the options? We recognized that given the nature of my work where I don't have to travel, but I actually enjoy traveling on right. the term Same. for speaking gigs. And at particular times, it made any kind of traditional job in his sector hard because there would always be travel for him too. And there wasn't really the option of working from home when you're a biologist. So when that conversation started, we realized it's not, I mean, he worked at a company that took exceptional care of him. It wasn't that, but like, how do we do something together? Because we're in alignment that our number one core value is family. So what would it look like if we did family and business together? Yeah. And that's when we recognized, okay, we need to hit a particular revenue goal. And it took probably 12 to 18 months from the time we started to explore that idea to make it happen. And I think a lot of people are more strategic, truthfully, about the integration of a partner when they make this choice. We kind of knew that because our daughter would be starting preschool full time at the time he joined and with that, there would be her constantly having vacations, um, school breaks, being homesick a lot, things that actually didn't really happen when she wasn't in school because we just had a consistent, uh, we had consistent childcare helping us, that his role would probably be 50% taking on more of the domestic responsibilities as a parent and more of the the caretaking and maybe 50% of his time in the business. And what the role looked like initially, operations, we realized that's not really his skill set. He can do great on the ground operations because he project managed and was a director of face-to-face teams, but he's not going to necessarily learn the online business. And so it took maybe a year for us to figure that out, to get a better online support team in the background for him to recognize, okay, he does a phenomenal job taking care of our elite clients and helping to plan all of our events and doing photography and running our media team. So there was definitely some navigation that that took place. Yeah. I imagine there has to be. Um, Are there ever any challenges with the fact, I mean, are you full on partners? Do you make 50% decisions together or are you kind of the boss? (laughs) I don't know if we would think of it in either way. And what I mean by that is I don't think that we would say we are 50% partners in terms of the decisions in that I'm still the one who's delivering the content. He is not. Yeah. However, there's not a single decision we don't talk through and evaluate, but I'm definitely generating more of the 
ideas because the ideas are built on what can I create and deliver, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. But I don't think we've ever gotten to a situation where we've really fought for something and it's like, well, I started this company, I win. <laughs> no, I don't think that would be the healthy response either. But. Well, but sometimes you get to an impasse. And when I think about how we operate in the business, it's pretty much like how we operate in our marriage or in parenting, where we definitely disagree a lot, but we stay in that messy conversation until we get to a place where we both are comfortable with whatever decision is made. Yeah, uh, that is such an important thing that that fo- so many people just can't handle conflict and they want to get out of the messy conversation as fast as they can. Um, but the real growth happens when you stay in it and you yes. work all the way through it. And it doesn't even matter what we're talking about. Whatever the messy situation is, staying in it and working through it will provide better benefits than going, it's okay, whatever, you win, I'm out. Absolutely. And what we found is that when we take something that feels like a real struggle and we break it down, oftentimes we can figure out one piece, how to resolve it, and then keep addressing piece by piece. So if we have a program that's not working rather than saying, do we keep it? Do we let it go? It's like, well, if we're a few weeks away from a launch, we're probably keeping it. So how do we address one thing that feels wonky and then do a postmortem and think about where do we want to go with this moving forward? Yeah. I love that. So tell us about your book. You'd mentioned it earlier. Um, I'd love to hear all about it. And I always love to hear what someone's writing process is like, because I think it's so brave and vulnerable to write no matter what you're writing about. So my book, Step Into Your Moxie, Amplify Your Voice, Visibility, and Influence in the World, came out from the time we're recording this almost a year ago to the day. And it is designed for women who want to develop the mindset and the skill set to be able to walk into any room or onto any stage and unapologetically speak up for themselves, for the ideas and issues that matter most to them, and know that when they speak, they will move people to take action. Love that. And I love this book, not only because she's mine, I've written a few (laughs) other books that nobody needs to find. Um, (laughs) But the the reason I love this book so much is New World Library, who's the publisher, really let me write the book that I wanted to write in terms of it being Mm story-driven and not just stories that always are like come to Jesus stories where like, I mean, there's definitely several of those where you find yourselves on your knees, like praying to whatever you believe in for some (laughs) guidance. Yes. But stories that are all about communication, whether it's the communication we do with ourselves, which which, let's face is the foundation for any of the communication we do in the world, but also communication in terms of how to speak up for our businesses and how to be able to negotiate and be unapologetic about wanting to make money, Um, conversations with our partners, like just looking at communication and from different lenses and to be able to write a book that is a balance between the deep self-development work and also the tactical, how do you make these changes and use these tools in the world in a practical way? Yeah. I love it. Well, I can't wait to get a copy. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. And in fact, it wasn't even, um, on my radar until you mentioned it. I'm like, Ooh, I want to hear all about it. So what was your writing process like? So I think my writing process is probably different than most people's in that I consider myself a writer first and foremost. And the reason I wanted to write the book is because when I lead my retreats and events or give my talks, people would always say to me, I wish that I could go back and read this or listen Mm, to this exactly as you said it. (laughs) And so the way that I wrote my book was the way that I tell my clients to create their speeches, which is not sitting down, staring at a screen and writing. And rather I would stand up, I would walk and talk, tell Mm -hmm. stories, ask questions. And I, I'm not a recorder, so I didn't record it and then transcribe it. I would just take what I retained from doing that and sit back down and then write a chapter. Oh, that's fascinating. I've had certainly several people on the show that do um, talk to text or record and transcribe, but so you just practice a speech Mm -hmm. essentially and and then sit down. And if it was relevant enough, if it spoke to you enough to remember it, it got written down. Yes. And to be fair, a lot of the stuff I had spoken in some way in a retreat, in a keynote, in a facilitation, there's some stuff that I hadn't used before that got brought in. And 
one of the the goals was to keep it feeling very conversational. Yeah. And I loved the opportunity to be able to do my audiobook. So in a total cosmic wink moment, we had gotten the original book deal. Um, and my agent was like, hey, Penguin Random House reached out and said that they were really impressed with the publisher's marketplace announcement and they want to read the book. Uh, are you okay if I send it to them? And, <laughs> or I should say the book proposal, because when we sold the book, I only had two chapters written. I was like, y- yeah, unless you tell me otherwise. <laughs> and I wound up selling the audiobook rights before I had a finished book to Penguin. Amazing. And it was because, I, and I don't remember the exact publisher's marketplace description, but it was very much about the only way to really empower women to come home to their voices and use them more powerfully in the world is to help women really hear their own voices, which is why this is a book that's meant to be written uh, or to be read and to be heard. Love that. I love it. Well, we're going to make sure to have links on the show notes, both to the audio version and the print version. So you can all check that out for sure. As you've gone through this major growth and, and learning to go from being whatever it, it was, it was, the easy thing in front of you, right? The scientist, the yeah, whatever, all of those things were. Um, what would you say has been the biggest struggle for you? Oh, there's so many. Um, honestly, I think I could boil it down to one word, which is not one of my three words. The, the <laughs> words I picked are the opposite. So control. So learning how to shift from control to yes. surrender has been the hardest because yeah. one of my most uncomfortable spots is when something isn't working or something goes wrong. I actually have a pretty okay time trusting that in the end it will work out because everything, Marie Forleo would say everything's figure out full. And I would it say is. though, everything is survivable. Like that's a huge word for me. Can I survive this? But even if there's the trust there, being okay, being in the discomfort of not knowing what the answer is, has been the hardest thing in terms of running my business. Not so much, I I would say, in the speaking, maybe initially. Like, what happens if I forget my lines or people have a response? Like, trusting in the moment, if I'm really present and I'm 100% focused on connecting with my audience, the answer will emerge because when I'm doing that, there's no room for self-doubt. Like I learned that lesson first, yeah. but having that same ability to translate that into my business or into my parenting when you know something happens with my daughter yeah. and it feels like I have to figure this out immediately. That's been <laughs> a lot more challenging. <laughs> There's a lot to that as a parent where we we feel this urgency to solve it all, but really we we most often need to sit with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to take that with me for the day. I'm going to sit with that and figure out how to better use that um, with my four daughters. So thank you for that gift. I love, so I, I get to ask the, I get to ask whatever I want because it's my show, but I get I to ask say, the, yes, you do. <laughs> the biggest struggle. And I, and I like that question because um, it causes us to really think, but then I get to ask you, what has been the, the biggest pleasant surprise? What did you never anticipate, but that's completely wonderful? That I can make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. And, and I say that because if I'm really honest, I used to always think that if that happened growing up and I came from a certain amount of privilege and my dad was an entrepreneur, but we had kind of a complicated relationship and I didn't necessarily think that being an entrepreneur, I I don't think I even considered the idea that that would happen. I always thought I would do something in a profession. And if I worked hard enough, someone would bestow money on me. So if I was a scientist and I like created the solution for you know, a a cure for cancer, then somebody would give me money for that. Or I love to act, you know, if I wound up being an actor and I got a great salary for a movie, someone would give me money, but it never occurred to me that I could generate revenue and have my own business until I kind of dramatically decided to leave my job in the nonprofit sector over the course of 60 days when, and it wasn't like it was a particularly toxic environment, but when my now husband asked the rather rhetorical question at the time, will you marry me? I I knew I could answer that question, (laughs) but I couldn't answer a more pressing question at the time, which was who do I want to be by the time I'm married? Because I had a phenomenal education. I mean, I was, I just graduated grad school at NYU. I had a grip of student loan debt. 
I owed more money in student loans than I made in the course of a year. And I was like, I am overworking, I am under earning. And while I enjoy the work that I'm doing, I'm also getting coffee for way too many people that could be getting coffee for themselves. Like yes. something's got to give here. And it was at a time where the economy was doing really well about like six months in, all of that changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like I had no fear because unlike some people who leave a good gig for me, it was like, well, I can walk right back in and under earn. <laughs> but right. what, if, right. what if I have the capacity to align my values, my strengths, my enthusiasm with profit? Like how cool would that be? And maybe I could give other women permission to do the same. I think that's awesome. Does it feel brave? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it feels, it didn't feel brave to do it. It felt brave to stick with it. Yeah. Because, you know, when you're in your twenties, even with student loan debt, like there's not that sense of if I F this up, I'm effing up somebody else's life other than maybe my own. (laughs) Right. But now every decision I make, I think about what's the impact going to be on my daughter. And like in 20 years, is she going to be in therapy talking about, you know, (laughs) that choice my mom made, Probably, you know, or my dad made (laughs) that scarred me in X way. (laughs) There's a deeper sense of responsibility now than there used to be. Yeah, I totally get that. And I love that you said yes, without hesitation, because week after week, I hear people say, no, it just felt like I I had to. And I get that, but there's so much power and empowerment in knowing you're choosing bravely. Yes. And one of the things I know you talk about as well is like being brave is not the absence of fear. You know, it is feeling all those feels and not being paralyzed and taking action anyway. And for somebody like that's been the theme of my life is learning how to speak up amidst all of those feelings. And so every time I feel uncomfortable, which is frequently, and I I wrestle with it and keep moving forward, that is me stepping into my moxie or that is an act of bravery. Yeah, absolutely. Love it, love it, love it. The work that you do is is very aligned with the work that I do. And folks like us, um, we we give a lot, not just of our time, but of our of our energy. And I'm curious for you, how do you practice self-care? Do you have any any daily rituals, anything, anything that keep you grounded and steady um, and sort of drown out the noise? There's a bunch of things that are in my toolbox, but if I'm to be really honest, which is what I strive to be all the time, (laughs) not all of them are used equally. And so I want to focus on the things that are my non-negotiables. So the non-negotiables are in the morning and at the end of the day, five minutes of meditation, whether that's listening to a guided visualization, oftentimes it is me just lying in my bed, taking myself through something, repeating a mantra, doing box breathing where I count my inhalations, I hold, like I have to do something like that for sure. Um, The other big one that I 100% put into the self-care box is doing the work to make sure that I'm the protagonist in my self-talk. Yes. Because more important than a massage, the yoga mat, which I love my yoga mat, but like there's times where I don't get to it for a week or two. Mm -hmm. Um, Last year during the book stuff, there was a period where I didn't get to it for like three or four months. Like I actually don't worry about that as much because those all feel like habits that can come back very easily. But the one that is the hardest to sustain and therefore I put the most energy and attention toward it is the self-talk piece. How do I speak to myself in a voice of compassion? How do I ask myself questions and let questions be mantras so that I'm consistently connecting myself back to my ability to be in choice, to be in power rather than to be a victim or a martyr or any other part I don't want to play. Yeah. I love every bit of that. Can you share uh, one of your mantras with us? Yep. So I've got a few of them. One that I've been working a lot recently is I surrender control to regain my freedom. Mm. So that's a big one for me when I'm in like needing to control stuff when it's around money, let's say I'm going into a launch or an enrollment period a big one for me at those moments is money flows to me and grows for me with ease and in abundance. And that might sound like a lot, but like I can literally carry that around. For sure. I've been doing it a lot. Money flows to me. Money flows to me and grows for me with ease and in abundance. And that just always helps me settle back into that place of mm-hmm. trust that prosperity is not about the money. Prosperity is about who I am and how I'm showing yeah. up. 
Oh, that's, those are awesome. Thank you very much for sharing those with us. I, I'm a big mantra fan. I, I use them a lot. So I might, I might borrow them. Thank you for that. Please, they're not um, trademark, <laughs> registered trademark. I know, I know. <laughs> I tell people that all the time. They're like, oh, I stole it. I'm like, no, it's it's free. Take it, use it, enjoy it. Don't steal um, brands, steal, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Still absolutely. The process. <laughs> absolutely. I would love to know as you move through these wonderful experiences in your life and connecting with clients and all everything that you've just mentioned, how do you celebrate success? And I don't necessarily mean really successful launches or being yeah. asked to keynote at this great function you've had your eye on. I, I do mean that, but more than that, your everyday, your, your, yeah. your slow, small successes. How do you celebrate them? Yeah. So the big stuff, and I appreciate you not asking that that's like a happy dance. It's not terribly complicated, yeah. but <laughs> the, the everyday stuff, and it's been a big pivot because I, I would say that this has only been the last maybe 12 months. I stop asking what's next and oh, I stay and yeah. I savor what yeah. is right now. And oftentimes I celebrate a success or a period where I've been working hard on something by making the deliberate choice not to to do something next, to enjoy and to linger and to take more walks or get Mm -hmm. back on the yoga mat more or um, have more silly play with my daughter and my husband. That was really hard for me for a long time because I always felt like, okay, if I doubled revenue, let's do it again or let's increase. And a really uncomfortable but necessary goal for the second half of 2019 was to not try to grow revenue from 2018 because mm. revenue had doubled. Like it, it's been great. Um, some things happened in terms of like the book and where I was able to put my attention where it felt like it's more important to maintain, but to have time to play and to breathe than to be busy figuring out what's next. And so there's a couple projects Mm -hmm. I'm super passionate about that have 18 months till they're going to launch because initially I thought, Oh, I could do that in six months. I could do that in nine months, but But it cost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good for you. I I love that. And what a gift for our listeners to hear that. Because especially as a nation, uh, we are so tunnel visioned into the next keep going, keep going, keep going. And there's just so much gift in the pause and the reflection. And what do you really want to do next and not moving too too quickly? So thank you so much. One of my favorite questions that I strive to ask myself and I'll ask other people is who do you think you'll be when that thing happens? Mm. Because all the stuff, yes, it might be about feeling like we're making impact. So so your answer, if it was, well, I feel like I'm impactful or I'm able to touch more lives. Great. How can you do that right from where you are right now? Or on the flip side, if we're really honest, a lot of times it's like, well, I would feel successful (laughs) or I (laughs) would feel like I belong or I'm worthy. And why? Yeah, exactly. How do we cultivate that from where we are so that it's not about the achievement that's going to give us the ideal outcome? Like the feelings we want to feel are ours to create right from where we are. I love that. I love it. Well, we are closing in on the end of this conversation, although I think you and I could sit and have a cocktail or a cup of coffee and talk for a very long time. Um, our, I feel like our visions are so aligned, uh, but I would love to know what your favorite charitable organization is to support. So I know you always ask this question and don't kill me, but I'm going to give you a few and here's why. <laughs> As somebody whose story was really born from speaking up and out about sexual abuse when I was four years old, I'm incredibly passionate about any organization that is working to um, empower not only survivors of childhood sexual abuse or sexual assault, but that are also working within the family structure to heal families Mm -hmm. and in in many cases also perpetrators. And so in my community of Las Vegas, there are a few organizations, whether it's Purple Wings, it's working with girls who are often being sex trafficked or Family and Child Treatment Fact of Southern Nevada, which works with everyone across the family, including sexual offenders to heal, um, to more national organizations, whether it's RAIN or Mm -hmm. Darkness to Light, which works with children. Like I just want to kind of highlight (laughs) 
Well, the importance of, of supporting those organizations in our local communities, as well as those that are working more nationally. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We'll give them all a little bit of love. And listeners, um, that's a hard topic to, to talk about, but it's one that's so necessary. So check these organizations out, give what you can, whether that's time, money, a few social media likes or share their page, whatever it is that you can do, because certainly this is an area that as a community, we can make a difference in and we can we can change the lives of these children. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, Alexia. You're welcome. Can you share your three words with us one last time? Moxie, surrender, trust. Those are beautiful words. When you shared them with me right before we started the conversation, I, um, I kind of got chills. And I think you did such a lovely job of, of sharing with us why those are your words and how, especially love this idea of just trusting yourself and the journey and the moment and knowing that it's going to all be okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I loved having you on the show and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Thank you for holding space for this conversation and for all the beautiful, brave conversations that you do. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. You know, friends, Oftentimes I find that bravery is simply about showing up. And I'm here to remind you that you are already good enough, smart enough, and worthy enough. The question is, do you believe me enough to make the difference you were born to make? I hope you do. And I'd love to hear how you're showing up. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. You share this with us. Tell us what you're grateful for. Leave feedback on the show. Feedback is important. And I would love to hear what you think is going great or what you'd like to see that you're not already seeing. And speaking of showing up, have you joined our Brave community on Patreon yet? I'm counting on you to become a supporter. Become a member of our Brave movement and help us sprinkle bravery, celebration, and gratitude around like it's glitter. I can't do this without you. So please visit patreon.com slash brave files and join us today. This is Heather Vickery. I am so glad you decided to spend a little time with us. I hope you go out today and every day and choose bravely. Today's show was brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash the brave files and browse their unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title of your choice for free and start listening. It's that simple. Just head to audiotrial.com slash the brave files. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, or get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we'd love to know what you think. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music is produced by Matt Lewis. Follow him on Instagram at mattmmusic or visit his website, theunionband.com. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to our associate producer, Kim Statler. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.